Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. This is Rob here at Smirking Interviews, and today we're talking brand new comics on New Comic Day, and I was trying to figure out which one do I start off with, and you clicked on it, so you know what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about Guardians of the Galaxy number one. It just finished its run with Donny Cates' 12-issue run, and now we're starting with Al Ewing, who is still currently on Immortal Hulk. And <laughs> this one's... <laughs> I mean, I was excited for it, right? But there are a lot of people that probably aren't. And I think that, you know, in a way, some people have a point. Um, Al Ewing doesn't seem to have the greatest relationship uh, with the fans or the readers or people that just piss him off. Um, I have tried to just worry about the content of his books. Um... And, you know, some people probably will have an opinion about that, you know, like, why, you know, like, if he's not such a great person, then why am I reading his books? But, I'm, I am. I, I don't know what else to say about it. I, I at least want to give it a chance, because I still like Immortal Hulk. That is another book that a lot of people feel like now that it's gone into this more uh, corp fighting corporate America phase of the, the Hulk, which I don't think it's completely gone that way. I think there's a lot of really interesting things going that are coming up about Hulk's different personalities, and still the one above below all. I think there's a lot of stuff going on in that book still. So when I heard he was doing Guardians of the Galaxy after Donny Cates, well, I was like, well, at least to me, they're picking a good writer, somebody that I have liked recently. Now, I know that some people also said that uh, maybe, you know, like Al Ewing wasn't really that great of a writer until Immortal Hulk or whatever. I'm, I'm trying to ignore all that and just, you know, you like what you like, you don't, you like, you hate what you hate, whatever. So Guardians of the Galaxy number one comes out, Al Ewing's writing it, and uh, Juan Cabal is drawing it. And for, I, I could only afford to get one of these this week, and I, so I had to get the Pepe Larraz one because of, you know, Powers of Ten. Uh, I love his work a lot. So I got the variant of this, it didn't cost me anything extra. I might pick up a standard number one one of these days. I'm sure that there's going to be plenty of them laying around. So, was Guardians of the Galaxy number one by Al Ewing and Juan Cabal any good? And, well, you know what? I, I dug it. I dug it. It's a nice jumping off point for this new story. But, you know, if you're not into what is inside this book, I can understand that. Um, because what we're dealing with here, and we're setting up a few different things, because, and we're also talking about bo some other books that are probably going to cross over with storylines in the Guardians of the Galaxy. Because they start kind of alluding to the stuff that's going on with the Shi'ar. And you know that that's going on in the New Mutants book with uh, Deathbird and Guardian and Bobby DaCosta and, 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 the, and the Savior and Lalandra's daughter that first came up, I believe, uh, like in Mr. and Mrs. X. We've got stuff that's going on. Um, they allude to this in here. Uh, before the big fight. Let's get to it. Um, yeah, the scrolls. Detonating suns, uh, sending out fleet war fleets out past their borders, telling nobody why they're going there. I think that has to do with the Imperium thing. I think uh, the Kree civil war is on pause, but there's a lot that that goes on in this book. And kind of one of the overall themes in the book, because they say it over and over again, is nowhere is safe, which also made me think of the place nowhere. But the beginning of this book is this kind of it's this planet place called Elysian 3 and it's basically just colonists working uh, I really like this you get that the Kree all powerful th uh, what is it the the thing from Captain Marvel I can't remember what uh, they called it but it was like the, it, the big mind the great big Kree mind up in the sky and everybody's saying oh nothing war's not coming here war's not going to touch us and of course you know that that's not going to be true because then the next page we deal with Zeus and all the gods of Olympus, right? So it's not like the Asgardians. These are the Greek, you know, you know, Zeus and, and her, you know, Aphrodite and her, Hephaestus and uh, Hermes and all them. They've all been like reborn and they've all gone like toxic. Kind of like what the Church of the Universal Truth was doing. 
um, and they've all gone like rogue, and they they got their whole city like going in and out of dimensions uh, as they take them over or destroy them, really. And so the Guardians, though, after everything that's happened in Danny Cage's run, they're kind of enjoying like the family life, literally. And I thought that this was the only part that was a little weird, seeing Gamora being like a homemaker and all of a sudden going from warrior to, you know, Donna Reed. Um, but it all felt like it was, they were all fooling themselves or they're trying to fool themselves that they can just go on as, you know, oh, the fight's over, we can't do this forever. But I mean, like I said, Gamora's like <laughs> like one of the, world, the universe's most deadly assassins. And here she is playing Polly Homemaker. While Rocket, you know, after he almost died, he's wearing a suit, which I, I don't even care. I like it. I actually like it. When I saw the cover for number one and he's wearing a suit with a gun, I actually just thought it looked cool. But Star-Lord and Rocket are having this pull towards the fight because Rich Rider shows up trying to say, you know, explaining them to what happened. The Olympians from Earth... But they've gone through some changes, some kind of cosmic death and rebirth cycle. They've woken up cranky. Um, and they say, that according to the survivors, his people arrive from nowhere, and literally from nowhere, like I said, the place, I think. It's, they, they always highlight those words from things and places that we know. Like, whenever somebody says Civil War, they just automatically highlight the word Civil War so we can all go, oh yeah, remember Marvel Civil War? Um, so... <laughs> They say they come out of nowhere and wipe everything clean, destroying everything in his path, like a flood or a hurricane, and taking tribute and blood and treasure. Fuel for the floating city of New Olympus as it rotates in and out of this dimension. So as they come and go, they, that's their destruction fuels the city. And, you know, we also get, like, Rich tells, uh, you know, Star-Lord about the whole thing with Scourge Annihilation, and why he's asking for help, that he died. Um, we're also introduced to this new character called, I think he's a new character, called Marvel Boy. He's the guy you're here. And I, I rolled my eyes. If you could audibly roll your eyes, I think that my eyes would have made a noise. Because he just, do we need another character with the name Marvel in their, char in their name? But he says, I'm a parallel universe Cree allied with the utopian faction. Actually, I founded that. I can walk on walls. My fingernails are an explosive compound. My saliva is a psychedelic drug. I have total control of my body and mind. I carry my own laws of physics with me as a weapon. Pronouns are he slash him. That name again is Marvel Boy. Any questions? And the first thing I thought of after I rolled my eyes and listened to this diatribe of his powers of exploding fingernails and saliva that is like ecstasy and I mean I did think that the, I carry my own laws of physics with me was interesting but the first character I thought of was Kid Omega from X-Force right now this arrogant douchebag who has like just kind of walks around like he's God's gift and that's exactly what I thought. So if anything bothered me about this issue, really, it was just kind of, it was moments like that. Like this guy. I don't know if this is his first appearance. <laughs> but, I mean, I, some of this stuff can end up, you know, there's interesting things you can do with it. But I feel like exploding fingernails and saliva as a psychedelic drug are just going to be little silly little, oh, I got some spit on me and now I'm tripping. Or, you know, he accidentally cuts a fingernail and blows out the window of the ship or something and everybody gets sucked out. Except that doesn't really happen, does it? Um, and so that part kind of was like, uh. But I did like the pull that, that Star-Lord and Rocket have. That they're just like, they both kind of seek, sneak off into the night after agreeing to not really go. Especially Star-Lord, who leaves Gamora sitting there and tells her over text. It's like, what is he, Phil Collins? So, um, that's like a one percenter joke right there. So they go off anyway, and they, they decide that they need to, to fight these guys, they need a distraction. So, uh, Phi Lavelle who is a Captain Marvel from another reality, which I was like, all right, cool. Maybe Phi Lavelle's going to have more personality than Carol Danvers. So I was cool with that. So they go in to do the distraction while Peter and Moondragon and uh, Marvel Boy and Rocket go in to try to basically 
throw their whole like planet of Olympus outside of whack, sneak in stealth wise with Moon Dragon's telepathy, uh, telepathy powers, and and hide themselves from the minds of the other gods. Which you know, after a while, you know that that's not going to work because it's the Guardians of the Galaxy. So something has to go wrong. I do like this kind of like them showing her tr them trying to sneak through. Nice little splash page. And I got to say, I do really like the art in this. I do. It's not the best in the entire world, but I thought, you know, a lot of times I was actually prepared for, like, really bad art. But Juan Cabal's uh, art is pretty good, man. I like it. Um, once they figure it all out, though, they come and they attack. And this Marvel boy does save Moon Dragon from being taken out by, uh, what's his name, by Hermes. He just kind of pops up out of nowhere, and I feel like that's part of his like whole thing is the laws of physics. Like I do, uh, Rocket asks him a very important question. I thought it was or an interesting question, where it's like your powers. Um, can you uh, create like a, a, a black hole, <laughs> like a time bomb, <laughs> wherever we want? That's because, oh, he calls it the pocket battlefield, a localized area where physics are what I say they are. Yeah, can you time it like a bomb? Can you can it make black holes? Yes and yes. So that's an interesting thing going forward as well. But in the end, we find out that they've got Hercules trapped, and it looks like he's powering the ship. Like that he's the source that they're using him his like god energy to power everything. That's what it looks like at face value. But he says, I'm here to help. Everything's going to be okay. Which is kind of a Hercules thing to say, especially when he's tied up. Uh, well, basically locked up in the ship. It's a very, it's also kind of a God situation. It makes me think of like, you know, like holding up the walls of something with strength and everything. But it feels like they, that's something Hercules would arrogantly say. Of like, I'm the one trapped, but I'm here to help you. I think overall, this is a pretty good number one. I think that there are some problems with, like like I said, Marvel Boys in here. Uh, if you're not into the story of like Zeus and them, which a lot of people might be like, this is a cosmic story, why are we dealing with, you know, we've already got Asgardians, why do we need to deal with the Olympians? But I think it's an interesting wrinkle, and that's just the beginning of these stories that are going to be told. So as far as number ones go, I think it's pretty good. I do recommend it. Um, if you're not an Al Ewing fan and you are, are, are adamant about not reading Al Ewing, then I don't think this is going to change your mind. Um, but I do think that there's more positives in this book than negatives. And I, for one, am excited to see where it goes, especially now that they've quickly gotten away from them being just family members. That's another little bit of a problem because you've got Groot and Drax there and Gamora still back at uh, other... I think they call it Otherworld? Not... Uh, what did they call it? Half world. And so they're eventually going to have to become a part of this story. You can't leave your heavy hitters sitting there. Uh, and it was just a little too strange seeing them just playing house. So anyway, that's the review. I, I really dug this book. I was afraid I wasn't going to like it, but it turns out to be pretty good. All right. So if you like this review, please hit the like button, comment, share, subscribe, hit the bell for all notifications. You can find me on Twitter at reviews underscore gun. Otherwise, keep reading comics, and we will see you on the next video. Bye.